Okay, Edward, welcome to the Mojo Injection. How are you doing this morning? I'm good, really good actually. How are you? Good, yeah, the sun is shining, so I'm going to be doing a bit of work in the garden later, I think. <laughs> yes. I have a veranda with fake grass, so I can just sit and I don't need to worry about gardens or plants. I mean, that plant there behind me is dying, and I'm stressing out, thinking, oh, please don't die. I feel like it's like Jack and the Beanstalk, look, it's growing. <laughs> uh, I, need to, I need to buy soil or something. Anyway, I, maybe we can, after this, you can give me some tips on how to keep <laughs> plants alive. I'm not that good. I always say if, if my plants start dying in the house, that's a sign I need to slow down. I'm like, right. <laughs> oh, that's a good one. Yeah. That's, that's a good, oh, that's because I am, um, I joke, like I'll, I'll, I'll say, um, well, I, I've never, I've never really wanted kids, but I said, uh, I, you know, I'd, 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 I'll, I would get a puppy first and then I'm like, well, no, I'll maybe get a plant before I get a puppy because, and then I'm just like, killing the plants so there's no way I'm getting a puppy at a wane because that would not be good. It depends on the type of plant though because that one looks a bit complicated it probably needs a bit more love than your average plant. Yeah well it started off as an outside plant and it was dying so I brought it indoors and it's flourished but it needs more soil and I don't know where, where sells soil apart from garden centres and I'm not going there there's big queues in those places I can't be bothered doing that. Garden it's center. all the kinos that have missed it for so long. They're just like, get me in the garden centre. Oh, well, I was watching you sing last night. I, do you know what I hadn't realised? So when I came on to check out the mindfulness work you do, you do a lot of great stuff, which we'll speak about, but I was like, I hadn't twigged that it was you, like the guy that had gone viral and you'd been on Britain's Got Talent. Like, was it twice you were on? Yeah, yes, yes. And I was like, oh, talk, that's the blooming guy. Because I watched that live and I was like, his voice is amazing. Um, so I just want to ask you to sing. I always ask at the end, actually, of a song you like. So maybe you can sing us a little a cappella. You can sing us out a few lines. <laughs> I need to go to my, my playlist to see what I've got. I've not sung, I've not sung I have sung that's a lie, but um, yeah, I'm not performed I, I i'm used to performing every weekend like friday saturday sunday hosting events singing at events and it's obviously i've done some on zoom but not since lockdown and i did one the last thing i did was mother's day and uh, i did a thing for my mum and i just sang ballads mostly ballads um because that's what she wanted for her mother's day present was me to sing ballads for her that's so I, nice. I did it as a facebook live so i went to her house uh, all social distanced um, and then I was filming in her house, so it was great, it was a great wee um, show, lots of mums come on with their daughters and watched it obviously in separate locations, you know, at home, so it was something, because people couldn't do anything Mother's Day, it was a wee bit of entertainment for them. Good for you, what song had the, the best impact, was there one that really went down? Oh, uh, well, <laughs> so my mum always says, all, she's got, there's four of us, she always says we're the wind beneath her wings, she loves that song. So I actually recorded it for her as well, and then um, she loves you raise me up. So I was like, right, although this song start like so, I wrote because it starts like this. Listen to this. Right, that's just downright depressing, isn't it? Right. <laughs> so I was, I'm, I was like, right, let's. I said, I know this song. The, the song sounds depressing, but let's think. Have you, have you lost your mum? Don't get sad. If your mum's there, you can't. You haven't seen her for a year. Don't, let's just just think of the good times. Let's. So I was trying to. So <clears throat> during the instrumental bit, I turned around and I was like, "Mum, are you greeting?" And she was like, "Oh, just thinking rare news and and the shawl." And I was like, "Oh, for God's sake, now I'm going to greet." So I start I started greeting, and then I couldn't look at her. And then the very last sentence of the song, I just looked at her, and she was greeting, and I couldn't sing for crying. And I don't know, it wasn't like sad tears; we were laughing. But um, it was everybody was it was a great response because everybody was just going oh my god that was it was it was it was a, um, a really nice moment because you know you don't often well, I'll say mum cheerio love you and it's like a token love you but you don't oh, actually I don't ever stop her like and go ah oh, hiya just to let you know I love you and look in your eyes but like nobody does that you know but you just go I'll say to people I was on the phone to my pal on about night cheerio love you. And it's and we know we love each other, but it's a love you. So that was a moment where we really looked at each other's eyes, and it was it was that moment of vulnerability, and and it was lovely. It needs to happen more often, basically, but maybe not through the medium of Josh Groban and you raise me up. 
<laughs> oh, that song gets me every time though. And Wind Beneath My Wings. I'm like, oh, like just, I think music, it's got that power just to really get us into that like lovey frame of mind though. And that's when yeah. the emotions come, right? Because you've got the music. Plus the fact you're an epic singer. So, you know, if you were singing like, you know, a cat was drowning, it might not have been as emotional, but it might just be more funny. <laughs> well, that's, when I was on Britain's Got Talent, I was, um, so what happened when I was on Britain's Got Talent, I was working with young people and they just turned 17 and they, they had autism and they weren't allowed to sing kids' songs because of the age appropriateness. So I decided to sing songs like an adult so they, 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 they would sing old mcdonald but we wouldn't like to sing it if that makes sense just to just to make sure that nobody was be, no 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 one who had a additional support need was getting treated like a child you know mm -hmm. so i got that and i, I, I respect that I, 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 I don't like when people go hello how are you and there's somebody like 25 just because they've got um, additional support needs we automatically think we can speak to them like a baby um, yeah. and I'm, i don't i'm not into that so I was like, oh, we'll just do old McDonald's with the book. We'll do it like Beyonce. And so I was going, oh, McDonald's. Uh, 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 uh. um, and then, that, so I was playing about with different songs. But in my head, when I started singing it, I was like Whitney Houston. I, I, I was like one of those, one of those divas. That, and I was, and I was, and I was like um, grasping the air. I, I, I call it um, grabbing the midgy. Just grabbing the midgy and doing all that. And, um, uh, Shirley Bassey moves, but I, it's funny because when people are laughing at it, I have got, I want to stay dead serious because I think that's where the humour is, it's like, I'm singing a bit, but in my head as well, I'm like, oh my god, Humpty Dumpty has fell off a wall, this is dramatic, this is like epic, so keeping it serious maybe adds to the humour as well. Yeah, it was brilliant. And even Simon Cowell liked it because he's a tough one, you know, it's like if you do something a bit different, he could totally slate you. But yeah. he was actually pretty nice, wasn't he? Yeah, I didn't know. I, when I first went on, he wasn't there. Um, and I remember sitting at the stage of the stage, um, and I just thought, all I could hear was, <clears throat> and the audience were going off, 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 off. No. And I was like, what, what the hell am I doing? I feel as if I'm getting thrown out to the lions, you know, and the quality on this is horrendous. And I thought, right, I, I've got to live after this experience here, so I need to... They can boo me, they can buzz me, they can make the song a different key because they, they changed my backing track last minute. So all this fear was going through me. And I thought, in the words of Whitney Houston, they can't take away my dignity. So I thought, they they can um, come in, they can do what they do, but I'm not going to lose my dignity. So for somewhere, I felt a feeling come from my toes up to my body. Mm -hmm. And I had this detection on. Um, so when they when there was three thousand people got on their feet and cheered, and I was like, oh my god, oh my god, I'd never experienced anything like that. And all, all I remember saying to myself is, don't greet, don't greet, don't greet. You need you, you need to be dignified. And now I just wish I had that one single tear just rolling down my eyes because on YouTube that would be amazing. <laughs> but, um, on the live shows, I was expecting Simon Cowell to slate me, and he didn't. So then I burst out crying. But it was just the pressure of everything. It was. The up and down of London, the whole, you know, every week to, to do stuff, work with the production team. And then I kind of knew I wasn't going through. I just knew in my bones I wasn't going through to the final. Um, so I wasn't expecting them. I was expecting them to to say something negative. So I didn't, so I, um, it was nice. And it was a nice way because, I mean, yeah, I knew I knew I was going off that night. I just had a feeling. But it was a night, they gave me a nice send off. You know, they could have... They could have done, you know, they could have said negative things, but they didn't. And I'm so grateful because it's left a good taste in my mouth for Britain's Got Talent. And I, I think when people see you on those shows, they, they always remember what the judges say. And if they slated you, they, they kind of remember that. And they often, they believe, because someone's in a judging chair on a Saturday night, they believe their opinion, you mm. know, and it's just a bit scary, you know, because <clears throat> they should all be able to, form our own opinion and also I mean this whole judging culture that has just boomed from way back from pop idol where every Saturday night people sit in chairs and judge other people who are putting themselves on a stage and being vulnerable and trying something and then they get slated it's just so dangerous because it just encourages the rest of us to be judgmental. 
that's anyway, good, I'm on a rant. I'm on a rant. No, that's a good point. And that will fall into the mindfulness chat. I, I'll never forget watching Simon Cowell slate Will Young the first time he did his edition. And I was like instantly in love with his voice. I was like, I love it. Like I like went forward off my seat when I heard him. I was like, he's amazing. And then Simon was like, totally average. And I was like, what? And then Will Young sort of said, oh, I don't think you could ever call that average. He, he was very polite and stuff. But I, I always remember that's the first probably the judgy see, scene that I watched and I was raging. And I was like, who do you think you are, Simon? You know, <laughs> so I was really not... I think because I don't think the voice gets the same viewings as the X Factor does. And that's because the voice nurtures singers. They believe in singers. Whereas X Factor is all about slating and humiliation, and there is something about us that that we, we gravitate towards that that kind of coliseum, you know, the lines, people suffering. Um, I think when you see other people suffering, it makes your suffering it distracts you from your own suffering, kind of thing. So, yeah, unfortunately, it is it is appealing to people. I can't watch it now. I, I really can't watch um, a lot of um, judging programs because I just think. Uh, yeah, have, have my opinion on it. Do you know what? I just like the nice comments. And <laughs> I always feel, I never really liked the videos when people, they would show people on the X Factor where they were out of tune or whatever, and they were like, oh, they're such a bad singer. I always just wanted to watch the ones where people were loving it and they were getting all the praise and stuff. But I totally get that. It, it's like having studied mindfulness myself, like realizing the way the mind works. And maybe if you're in a low, point then your ego's really on fire and you're like oh judge 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 so I, I totally get that um and it's the same I always said like I love food and I, I always thought I wanted to be a food critic but I never like when I look at other food critics I never like them slating the restaurants and stuff I'm like if you don't like yeah. a restaurant just don't review that restaurant just yeah. <laughs> foods just say I'm not able to write a review rather than slate it I always if I see that on Instagram I'm like oh I don't like this <laughs> but it's funny because I don't I, I, I don't there must be a thing there must be a psychological thing because um when I I I, I was in the car with my friend one shot right, and we were on a road trip and I was like oh I love this song oh I love this song and then I was oh I love I love this song and he was like Ed you can't love every song and I was like I do, I do love every song. And it was like, oh, this, this is rubbish. And I was like, I love every song. I love, well, I, lo I love most songs. I don't love every song, but just so, I'm, so he was like, oh, oh. So, and I was like, and then I read the book, The Power, the follow-up to The Secret. Mm -hmm. And I was like, oh my God, I'm on the love vibration. Cause I just gravitate towards love. Um, I, lo I, I go towards love and everything, but some people don't respect my, what I've asked, say, I've asked, say, because my other friend that I'm talking about who's so critical of everything, right? And um, when I say, let's say we went to see a West End show and I'll go, oh my God, it was amazing. And then they'll look at him and they'll go, what did you think? It'll go, it was good. Yeah, it was good. And they'll take his opinion because they're so used to him being negative. Look, they think, well, it must be good if he's liking it. Do you know what I mean? Uh -huh. And I think that's the whole, that's the whole trick with Simon Cowell. You, if you slate 10 people, if you slate nine people and then you give the 10th person praise, everybody goes, oh, well, they must be good because they didn't like anybody else. I just find that exhausting. It is. <laughs> that's, so that's, how good critics, that's how good critics need to slate, I think, because it helps people trust them, if that makes sense. It's so you know? unfair, though, isn't it, when you think, when you put it like that, because it is you know, you look at a vibrational scale and you see that I, I know personally when I'm good mentally, as you say, you, you've you got yourself in a place where you just see the good. And if you're struggling or if we were to go really low and you've got like a mental illness or you're grieving or whatever, maybe that's just where you are in that really critical, but it's it makes sense, right? And then you could just say, well, they're not crap. They're just in a judgy mood. <laughs> It's funny. So how long, when did you do mind, when, how long have you been in mindfulness? So I started it officially um, in 2019, January 2019 is when my journey started. But your, yours was 2016, right? Yes, yes. Uh -huh. And for you, because obviously you're an entertainer, you're an amazing singer, you, I'm sure lots of opportunities came after um, Britain's Got Talent and you're doing loads of great events and stuff. 
what 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 made you decide to kind of get into this in 2016? Oh well, I've been <clears throat> uh, after Britain's Got Talent when I had that moment of awareness and like self acceptance and courage at the side of the stage. After it, it was a case of uh, uh, you know the, I was off the show. The buzz had left. The no, the phone didn't ring, which I expected it to ring. It didn't ring. Um, and uh, there was just a wee time of, right, okay, what's happening here? Who am I? What am I doing? This was, I was one minute on primetime Saturday night television, the next minute, nothing. Um, and then I started slowly getting work. But then the work came in thick and fast, and it was a bit overwhelming. I was down in London, and uh, I had that total imposter syndrome. Um, you know, and I would be like, I would get a gig, and I'd be so excited, going, "Yes, yes, this is what I've wanted. This is what I've dreamt of. I've manifested it. This is great." And then, to the gig was on the Saturday. On the Monday, I had this sickness in the pit of my stomach, of I'm going to find out I'm actually not that good. They're going to regret booking me. You know, what if they don't pay me? What if they? Oh my God! I was just horrendous, and I thought, I can't, I can't go through my life like this. I don't want to do it. Um, and then someone showed me how to meditate. I went to a life coach and she was like, try this. Now, people used to say, say to me, you should meditate. And I was like, Bolt, I'm not meditating. That's for hippies and weirdos. That's not for people like me. We medicate. I mean, a, a glass of wine and everything's all right in my life. But um, I, when she showed me, I just didn't think people like me meditated. I thought it was for um, either middle class people or, or people that went on you know, Tibet for a month and did all these amazing things. Not people like me that went to Blackpool and <laughs> Tenerife and stuff like that. Um, so I am, um, when I did it, I found a level of peace that I don't know when the last time I experienced. It was just bliss. Mm -hmm. And I remember coming away going, this is, I need this in my life every day. I want it in my life. Because I used to love to go for a spa treatment and the spa treatment would cost about 85 pounds. And then I would lie there for the first, you know, 10 minutes judging, what, does this girl like me? Oh my God, I'm, I, I, should I suck my belly in? Am I too fat? You know, all that judgment going on. I don't think this girl likes me. Her pressure's not good. I don't like her touch. I've just been in a, a whirl of judgment constantly, of just a fear. And then it would get to five minutes before the massage ended and I would find that moment of bliss. Mm. Here I was getting this, sitting in somebody's house um, in the space of three minutes. So I thought, I want this, I want this. And I started doing it. And again, like most people, it was trial and error. I hated it. I was like, well, I can't do it. It's too hard. I, I, I'm, not, I'm not a type of person. And then something would draw me to it again. I don't know what it was, but I would get drawn to it. And then the more I was doing it, um, the more I was talking about it. And I used to be asked to go in and do and service days at schools and nurseries. I don't know why. I had nothing up my sleeve. I used to teach drama, so I would kind of put some of that in. And I would just do an hour, and I would call it How to Be Fabulous Workshop. And it was just camp, and I'd wear a glittery jacket, and just, just I was just like going, I haven't got a clue what I'm doing here, but they've asked me, and they want me, so I'll create something. Uh, and then I would say to them, well, you should all meditate. Um, it's brilliant. And then I was like, I don't really feel confident in telling people what I do, because I don't know if it's right. So I looked into going this, in a meditation course, and I studied with the British School of Meditation, and that just blew my mind. Like the, the the science and the research behind meditation, I did not know anything about that. So I loved that, and then I I thought I was passionate about it, but then I like, kind of fell in love with it, and I felt empowered. I felt like I can go in and speak to accountants about mindfulness, or meditation, and mindfulness because. They might, they, they, they might be more comfortable with facts and figures, whereas people like us, maybe like I'm assuming you as well, gravitate to that feel-good factor, whatever feels good. We just gravitate there. Other people, no, they need to know, why am I doing this? So that empowered me. So I love that aspect of it. Um, and then that was, that was it. And I did bits and bobs. I used to do it as a hobby, almost. And I would do a lot of free stuff, just going to schools and do, because I was busy with my performing work. Um, and then it started getting a bit busy and I used to do auctions, I used to host auctions for charities and they would say to me, can you um, auction yourself off for a Saturday night of entertainment and I'd be like, oh God, I did it once 
I, I used to do it twice a year, and I would give up two Saturday nights for the certain charities. But then it was getting people would come up and go, it was just getting out of hand, and, I, and I, I had to say no, which I used to struggle with saying. So what I thought is, what I'll do is I'll say, um, I can't give up a Saturday night anymore, but what I can do is I called it Take Edward Day. So um, Monday to Thursday, you can buy me and I will get to your workplace and do um, a fun stress management mindfulness uh, hour with your staff. And they would sell maybe about three workshops a day. And I'd be like, I'd be, I'd be one doing the auction and I'd be like, oh, hold on a minute. I'm selling myself three times. But I mean, I, I knew it was for the charity and the charity were loving it. But I thought, no, this is good because I was thinking, this is good because even though I'm doing it for free, as practice for me, it's going to be random workplaces and doing this. And I knew I was making money at the weekend, so I kind of was like, no, I'm, I enjoy it. So, again, because I was passionate about it, I didn't mind. But the weird thing was, little did I know, COVID was going to happen. So all my performance work stopped. And here I was left with this wee tool belt of mindfulness. And I have to say, I'm so grateful for you know, doing it for free because now I'm, I've got a, I've got a couple of workshops that I can put to people and sell, and people are needing it more, actually more now than they did at the start of COVID. Yeah, so much. So it's like the anxiety through the roof. You know, people are really, really needing. They've needed it before COVID, as you say, just being really busy or you know with the pressures of social media and everything. But then COVID hit, and it's like, right, people are really needing it, and it. You know, it annoys me when like companies that have got loads of budget just don't prioritize it. Do you know what I mean? It's like it's the, one of the if, best things you can do. If the person with the purse strings doesn't see the benefit of it, because um, I work with a couple of companies and I know some of the most of the companies, the boss, the person who pays it isn't on the mindfulness Zooms of Teams. Um, and yesterday I was doing one and the boss was on it. And that was the second time I've done it. So obviously the, if the boss is enjoying it, then they'll pay for it. But of, often it's people that just say, it's the feedback they get from the staff or the staff want it. Or sometimes the staff don't even know they want it. Mm -hmm. but I try to deliver it as, as fun as possible. Uh, I love the best feedback I ever get. And I, I didn't, when I, the first time I heard it, it, it was like, ding, 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 ding. That's what I wanted. But I, I didn't think mindfulness could be meditation could be delivered like that. People said they laughed into relaxation. Now I'm not a comedian, but I try to make mindfulness as relatable. And I'll, I'll often talk about stories about myself and how I'm not mindful, and 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 things I've done that have made me stupid, or daft because of my, because of not being mindful. So people can resonate with it, and then they laugh and. And I think because I, I'd like to think I create a, a vulnerable space for myself and I'm like, look, I can be a clown, I can be an idiot sometimes, I can do this and I can do that. And I think it allows them to feel vulnerable enough to relax in front of a stranger. That's my thinking. So when I heard that, when people laughed into relaxation, I, I was like, that's good because I believe laughter is the best medicine. I believe that laugh your way out of anything. I mean, I smashed a beautiful vase the other day and I just laughed. I was, I was raging because I'd smashed it, but I was like, what, I mean, what else can I, there's nothing else that's smashed. I can yeah. maybe buy another, it was like TK Maxx, there's no, I don't think I'll ever find it again. So I was like, that, that's a one off, TK Maxx, oh! <laughs> but then I, was, I just laughed at it. Yeah. And, and um, uh, so I would rather, you know, la having that vibration of laughter and, be in my wee bubble. <laughs> yeah, it's so important because when we take ourselves too seriously, that's when things can get a bit messed up, right? Yeah. <laughs> you need yeah. to. So, did you have when you were doing this training? I don't know. Did you, in your course did you talk about uh, Paul Gilbert? He did the emotional regulation system. So that the course I did was with the Mindful Enterprise, and it was the um, the model that I loved the most. And I've had Paul on the podcast so he's the founder of compassion based therapy so what he did was he took a lot he took like the so the dopamine the green and uh, sorry the blue where we're striving so just say like you're getting all these calls as you were saying and it was it was all just 
comes like buses sometimes, right? I, I found that when I launched a book, it was like, oh, will you speak on this radio? Will you speak at this gate? And I was running around like a headless chicken and then trying to pick the two kids up from school. And, you know, it's like everyone's got the stuff, right? So that's like the dopamine when we're achieving. And it's good to have a bit of that. Like, I, I don't want to just become like proper and trans all the time. But I'm not doing any striving. But then, then as the red, so the model he put together, three of them the red is when we get like cortisol and adrenaline when we're um watching the news like i don't actually watch the news i just ask yeah. family updates but like <laughs> you're like i'm like what's dad just tell me the top like few things i need to know and um so that's like the red the cortisol and adrenaline if you're watching the news or you're disgusted by something on the telly or you know someone says something someone judges or, or whatever and then the thing that we're really lacking is the oxytocin, which is the green he put in his model. So it's called the emotional regulation system. And that was one of the bits of theory that I was like, I can use that. That is just, it makes so much sense. So that's the green. So I called it sustainability of the mind. So that's when we're in that state, right? So for you, did you have like a few sort of light bulb moments where you're like, right, I need to keep this as part of my life because it's very easy to get pulled back into the blue zone of on the busy train and perhaps lose oh. yeah i felt i would feel like i would do it for like four days and then something would happen and um, i would have a night out and it'd be a mad night out and then the next day i would just like wait on the couch and watch the real housewives and eat rolls and sausage and then that would lead on and then it would and then i would like have like three days without meditation and I would feel myself talk was, I mean, before I was uh, such a, I mean, I don't know, when I think back to myself, I want to cuddle myself because I'm like, that. oh my God, you were far too hard on yourself. That was, so my self talk would go back, slip into that. I would be oh, such horrible, you know, I'd say nasty things to myself. And then I would, I would build the awareness of my negative self talk. And I'd be like, oh my God, I, what, what? And I'd go, I've not meditated. I need to get back and meditate. And then, so I would do it and then I'd get back on track. But um, I remember one time and it was like, uh, ah, like the age, a couple of times it's happened actually, but this one time, an ex-boyfriend asked to get back with me, right? Mm -hmm. And I was like shocked. Uh, 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 but then at the same time, I was like, ah, yes, this is, what I, this is what I've dreamt of. I'd manifested it, I'd visualized it. But I was like, right, hold on, like, because I'd started meditating and I was in a really good place and I was like, right, Edward, you need to think. And then my gut was saying, don't get back with him. But my head, was, my ego was saying, this is what you wanted, so get back with him. So I was like, right, hold on, I'm going to meditate. Because um, I was asking all my friends, I was doing what I used to do, what do you think I should do? What do you think I should do? And then they'd all give me their opinion and I'd go, still wasn't any clearer. And I thought, oh, that's right, I meditate now. So I'll go and I'll meditate and I'll get the answer myself. So I sat down for 20 minutes and was all, you know, shuffling about, then eventually got to a place of just stillness. And then I opened my eyes after 20 minutes and I was like, still no answer, right? And I was like, oh, for God's sake. So much for this med med medication, meditation. <laughs> and then and I, I literally get in my car to go meet him, right? And I was like, I still don't know what to say. I think I was going to say yes anyway, right? But I get in my car. And um, the song, Tony Braxton, Unbreak my heart, say you love me again. Right? And I was like, oh my God, the universe is speaking to me through um, Smooth FM. Oh my God, this is amazing. And then uh, the next song, and I'm not lying, uh, I'm not lying. Let's go round again, baby, we'll turn back the hands of time. <laughs> and uh, so we get back together. Needless to say, we broke up since then. But that's that's the the the, the point was we, I needed to get back with them because we needed we both needed closure. We both needed to know that it wasn't right. Uh, my gut, funny enough, had told me not to get back with them, but I ignored my gut, and I did it. And I'm glad I did it because otherwise, I think it'd be still hanging. What if? What if? You know. Um, but also, I mean, I find music. I find the same meditation. No, the same prayer as the question and meditation is the answer and um, well I just go straight to meditation but I'll maybe say I played at the start and say right well, this is what I'm looking for and I meditate and I create that space mm -hmm. of just 
you know, work towards creating that space of just that stillness. Um, and then it's almost like I'm, I walk about and I'm, and look, I remember my dad died. And um, again, I think my da- the breakup of my ex-partner, my dad dying, putting mindfulness and medita- meditation into those experiences made them so much more bearable. Mm-hmm. Um, and I remember when my dad died, like he, he had cancer and helping him with intimate care and just thinking, I was just so in the moment. I was like, this is a privilege. This is amazing. It's not who and me, why me, why did I have to do this with my dad? You know, why is my dad get this? I was like, this is the, this is the reality. I'm so blessed. I can help my dad with this intimate situation. And I was talking to him and he was, he was an alcoholic. So he would say, he would say things like, I'm sorry for being in it. And I'd be like, listen, let that go. But you know, I'm the person I am because of your alcoholism. So let's celebrate it. I'm, I am more compassionate and resilient because of that. So there was great moments because of what I knew about mindfulness and meditation. I was able to create that. And I was able to, I years ago, started to tell my dad I loved him. Um, and even it'd be like, I'll quit you like, where you go, where you go? And that was like, I'd run out the house and go, oh my God. And then eventually it'd go, I, I love you and all, where you go, where you go? Till eventually we'd go, I, I love you too. Um, so yeah, mindfulness has been great. Oh, the point I was making there was, when my dad died, I remember like a couple of days after that, I was like, right, universe, God, give me a sign. I just need to know that, you know, I don't know what I need to know, but I need to know something. Literally get in my car. And my dad's favourite song and the song that he played at the crematorium was Come a Chameleon. Mm-hmm. And the radio, come a, come a, come a, come a, come a chameleon. So basically, <laughs> I think meditation is the question and smooth FM, smooth FM is the answer. Although I, I really shouldn't say that because I work up on a different radio station. So. <laughs> <laughs> it's so funny though, like... I- it, I totally agree with all this stuff and like some people are like yeah whatever but I like when you ask for signs or whatever like music or like sometimes I've said right I want to see a lily or I want to see a do you know what I mean and I'm like looking at all the windows I'm like <laughs> but it's probably better just yeah just sort of waiting and Wait, but I also think there is a there is a you know have you heard the Abraham Hicks mm-hmm. when they say like think of blue glass blue glass or yellow or feathers or something like that but I literally I first car I ever bought on like a higher pur- like higher purchase I went and it was a Micra now I didn't know what Micras were turns out they're designed for pensioners they suited me down to a T I loved them loved it and I literally drove out the car showroom and every second car I saw was a Micra yeah and I call it the Micra syndrome right because it's like it's just that raise that I, back then I didn't know what it was, but it's that that consciousness, and and when I started doing this work, and all I don't know if this happened to you, but every double digit on my phone, 11, 11, 10, 10, 15, I was like, oh my God, how about I sat, and I Googled it, and it was, there's different things for it, but I think it's just, you're just, you're just, it's in your awareness, so you're looking for it, so that's how I'm like that, um, fabulousness, 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 because the more you, 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 you believe it the more you see it the more it comes to you I think Mm -hmm. it's definitely it's so true isn't it and then it's like you're in that frame of mind have you ever because I've spoken to people and they've said if it can be if you're really connected right you can lose your groundedness and it's happened to me uh, where I was doing so much meditation I was getting so many signs that was actually freaking me out and I'd, I'd been doing an intense meditation course and there was chanting in it and all of that. And at the same time, I'd got into, I'd gone for Reiki and I was feeling like all this energy and stuff. And like, this was one theory of why I kind of had a bit of a mental slip. I went into like really high, like hypomania. So some people said, oh, you, you maybe lost your grounding cord because you were so up there. But also I was very, very busy. So there was two sides. There was like career, boom, 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 bang, bang. And then all that airy fairy stuff so I still don't know and I might never know but have you ever felt that you've lost that ground and you've got too like in the zone or high from it no never never and I think I'm a little bit scared of that yeah. um but also I'm quite um 
you know, I, I, I don't know if I've got a balance as such. I mean, I'd like, I mean, I love wine. I love chocolate. I love eating chippies. I love all the things that I shouldn't be doing. And, and I sometimes think, right, next year is the year that I will be that person that is, that, that you know, that doesn't, that just treats my body like a temple instead of a nightclub. Um, <laughs> and then, like, and, and then, but I think there's, I, I don't want to lose that balance, but I've never allowed myself to go there. I don't know whether it's because I'm not disciplined enough to actually meditate that often and go there. Part of me, I mean, I've, I've been on retreats and um, I, I, I've not liked them. Uh, I've never, I've been on three retreats. I've not liked them at all. Um, I don't know what it is. I, I, I find myself become very, very judgmental of people on them and especially the teachers. And I don't know, it's, it's a bad quality, but um, there's a bit of fear in me as well. I mean, I think, I've, I think I've been in bad retreats as well, to be fair. I went on one retreat and it was a yoga retreat because I wanted to do your better at yoga. And the guy was horrible and, and they were promised things and he didn't deliver them. And then it was just like, it was like that. It was just like uh, some of the things that he did, it took us to a nudist, a nudist beach without telling us and then stripped off in the scud and started doing yoga in front of us. Oh man. Shackers dangling everywhere. I mean, I was just like, <laughs> oh. And then he turned and he said, well, we're just being too British. We needed to listen up. I felt like, um, I felt horrible. I just, I, and, and then I left early actually. Um, and he took it, we had to do Kundalini dancing. And I thought there's somebody videoing this cause we're all doing this like beyond, I was like, that's, called dry humping in Glasgow, the way you talked about it, just was a bit, oh. And then it gave me a massage 80, 80 euros later and told me I had angry bills. Oh <laughs> my goodness. <laughs> Get me out of here. <laughs> and then I went another retreat and I was just, I just didn't, I didn't, so I've, I've, my intention has been to take myself out of this reality where there's work and there's, emails and their stuff but when I go to these places I don't know if I'm putting uh I'm putting some resistance up because I'm scared of what you know like I'm scared of what actually happens or maybe it's just not my bag I don't know yeah but you're obviously because when you did your mindfulness session you know you were talking about that that love which is like high up the scale so you have and you do feel like that really positive like your vibes are really high obviously you'll get triggers like we all get triggers but you know you you were talking about that power and that love that's within us so it's not like because because I just found that it was floaty when I got to that stage and I'm quite a free spirit anyway so I don't know if it was just a, a formula that just or maybe it was just the wrong time because I was trying to do the busy stuff and then I was happening. but I really did get and when I was going for Reiki people were chatting about like there's angels and all that sort of stuff and uh, I don't know if you believe in angels yourself but it was just it was almost like I started to see the mind as just all the stuff we learn in mindfulness the ego the mind can be an asshole your inner critic all you're talking about your imposter syndrome all that stuff and it was just like oh the mind yeah it was like i wanted to leave the mind but i was still in a body and i'm like well i don't want to die i want to stay here i like my life <laughs> but it was just like yeah the mind can just do one and i would just be like up here like yeah man like everything's possible and there was like no anxiety and oh yeah let's just do this and everything's gonna work out and yeah it's it was really you it was euphoric but I couldn't handle it for long because I wasn't sleeping and then I started to like lose properly lose it and you know this what was your practice because I get like that after two cups of coffee in the morning I'm like, bang energy brilliant I'm everything I can do there's nothing stopping me and then I go right and then I start shaking. I go, oh my God, there's too much caffeine in your body. So what, what did you do to get to that place? Because that sounds amazing. Yeah, but then a psychiatrist will just say, oh, it was stress and just due to mania. But so ah. there's two school of thoughts, right? But I know 100% I opened something up because so I, I'd, been, I'd started the Mindful Enterprise course in 2019, so January. And then this was after a busy year but was really feeling the vibes and had all the theory in place 
then about November, I started getting into Reiki. I went for Reiki and I was like, wow, I can really feel like strong stuff. And they would always say, there's so much energy coming off you. You've got this really strong vibrating energy. And I'd be like, yeah, yeah, like, okay, cool. Then they would get crystals out and stuff. And, uh, and then I was coaching TEDx speakers and I was at this event and one of the speakers asked if I wanted to join this 21 day um, Deepak Chopra course. Um, it's when you're doing your meditation and he does a chant. So you're doing that every, one, every day for 21 days and then there's exercises. So you've got to write about, you know, pushing the ego and, you know, the programming from all the different lines and like write letters to release all the stuff you've picked up from the past. And there's all this mindset stuff. So I committed to that. Uh, and then I started an energy meditation course. So that's when you tune into your chakras and you, you ground your body. You, um, so there's lots of different tools and techniques in that. So that was a bit more out there compared to the sort of basic meditation I learned through the course. And it was really tuning into different parts of the body and it felt more spiritual and more, yeah, the teacher was like really out there and stuff. Um, and that was on a Zoom thing, I was doing that. Um, and then also had this energy healer get in touch with me and say, um, from a journalistic point of view, did I want to interview her? And she would send me energy down the phone. And so from a journalistic point of view, I was like, right, I'm going to just lie on my sofa and see if I feel anything. I ain't joking. I was like, it felt like something entered my body, right? <laughs> and I said, Give me a number. <laughs> well, but the, this is the thing, but then I lost it after. I had two months of like proper meltdown. So I felt all this strong stuff. And then she came to hear me at a speaking gig. And she said, at the end of the speaking gig, I did a group meditation. And everyone was like, oh, like, oh that was amazing. But she was sending stuff because I felt that exact same feeling when she sat there and she said she'd sent stuff during that meditation. And it was the exact same feeling I got that morning. And I've never felt that anything you know when you get certain feelings you've never but I've never felt anything like that and I was like what is she is she putting a spell on me I don't know uh, and then when I went home that night I was like it was like I'd taken like pills or something I was just off my face on love and I went home to my husband I was like anything we've argued about I just think you're amazing like never feel bad I know you've had tough times too and I forgive you and oh come here and come up to the room and was really like properly like off on it like it was just like I was buzzing off my face um so that is natural right I hadn't had any alcohol hadn't had any drugs was freaking buzzing so I'll never forget that experience and I don't know if you've because you said you've obviously felt like buzzy from coffee and stuff but you've also felt that beautiful love from the meditation and toning down the ego and stuff i don't know if i just took it too far no, wait, it's funny because i i think i got a wee bit of I, I would call it fear right but um like people will say to me oh crystals and i'm like not interested i mean they're nice but i don't they, they don't make sense to me um i remember a friend said she was she was an actor an actor and she was working somewhere in the dressing room she was in the person had caused a lot of drama and she was like, I want to clear, can you recommend some sage? And I was like, I just buy a Joe Malone candle and it'll smell nice. I, I, that's the way my brain works. I was like, you are the energy. Uh -huh. You are everything. Uh -huh. Don't get a bit of sage. You go in and I remember my house got broke into once and um, money was stolen, my laptop. And, and I remember where, my la where everything was, I just stood and I just, I was like, right, that's it. I'm reclaiming this space. I'm not going to feel fear. I'm reclaiming it. And I was just like that. I was just, <laughs> I don't know what I was doing. I was like, it's, this is me. And I was like, that's it, done. And it was it was my bed where the money was and my laptop was actually hidden under my pillow, which they somehow found. And I was just like, I need to sleep here. This I'm not going to bed tonight with this. I was like, boom, that's it, gone. So I believe that it's, it's in us. So I, I'm more like that. Um, but I, I, I mean, I've done a Reiki course and introduction to Reiki and, and enjoyed the relaxation aspect of it. I didn't find anything wow about it. Um, the, the only thing in recent times that I felt the same wow-ness with meditation 
Um, I, I found it with EFT. Have you heard of that tapping? The, the EFT. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm, I'm I'm doing a course just now called Havening. Have you heard of it? I think so, but I've not dabbled in it. People think I'm saying Havening. I'm like, no, it's Havening. It's not Havering. I can have it for Scotland. It's Havening. It's the, from the word safe haven. Ah, right. Because I'll say to people, and all I want you to do is just touch yourself, and they'll be like, excuse me. <laughs> so it's, it's just um, movements like this. Ah, yeah, yeah. And uh, this, or this, and uh, I, there is a shift in me every time I work. So during the course, I was working, I teamed up with different people, and then I just clicked with this one woman. And I was like, she was in NLP, and I, and I was like, listen, because we've done case studies together and I was like, listen, I would like to pay you as like separate from the course and see you. So she's, I see her once a fortnight on Zoom and I, I come up, I come off buzzing. I, I like that, that buzzing. Like, I don't, I mean, I don't, it's just a, a euphoria. I feel liberated. I feel all my fears, all the stories that I've been telling myself. Because what this is, is um, she'll maybe identify something. So I'll strangely, so I'll be sitting and a memory will come up mm -hmm. about something that happened to me in my childhood mm -hmm. uh, about why I don't feel value, valued and a memory came up about my childhood the, the other week and I was like oh my god that's and it was a bit I've been in a shop with my friend's gran and another boy and she bought them sweets and didn't buy me sweets and I was standing there and I felt I was A and I just felt like a nothing. But anyway, she was like, oh, I suppose you better buy him some as well. And she bought a 10 pence mixture but took some out and then gave me it. So I was just like, I just felt like a, like a, a second rate citizen. I still took the sweeties right enough because I loved sweeties when I was eight. So I was like, I'll take them. And it's, and it's funny because now there's patterns in my life where I feel abundant when I'm buying Louis Vuitton shoes, or when I'm, you know, when I'm getting a Louis Vuitton bag, or I'm going to the Ivy, or I'm, you know, I'm going to Ritz for a, a coffee. I have to put them in my life, and they're very important to me. But now I've looked at that, I'm like, oh my God, that's just me trying to prove to the world that I'm valuable. So in that haven, then, we, that came out of me, because this this movement tricks your brain into think into thinking it's in a delta wave so your brain relax you're open you're more susceptible and then you use distractions so she used distractions and um, and basically what you're doing is you're uncoupling the neural pathways that have been created in your childhood and trauma and then you're able to place so she places positive things in there so i will leave and one of the ones that she's given me which when i do it on my own in the morning I feel tingles. It's like no need for coffee today, no need for anything. I don't need to go online at Amazon Prime and buy myself anything to feel good because I'm like, I feel, I'm like, I, I, but it's, it's, I think it's, I'm, I am loved, I am lovable, which is a cracker for me, lovable. Um, I am safe, I am capable, I am protected, I am guided. And I do that and I do it for about 20 minutes, 10 minutes sometimes. And bam, I'm like kicking indoors, walking out of the room and going, it's me, I'm here, everything's okay. So if after this, if you ever want to do, like, l l let me show you, let me do one on you and see what you think of it, because it is amazing. Wow, it sounds amazing. Do you like listen to music while you do it or anything? Or do you just no. sit and you say the stuff and then you just do the... Oh. The, the distractions are funny, the distractions, are, and most people I've had go from a stress point of 10 right down to a zero. Mm -hmm. um, and it normally stays with them. Wow. Some things you need to work, they, they need to do it on their own, some things you need to come back, but most people that I've worked on have been down to zero, and they don't understand, because what happens is, you remember the trauma clearly, mm -hmm. you don't have the emotional attachment to it. Yeah. And, and it's like that thing they say, um, trauma is like being hit with two arrows. Uh -huh. First one is the pain, or the, the, the experience of the trauma, and the second one is the suffering that you take in your life after yep. it. And basically that's just taking away the suffering. Uh -huh. So you remember the trauma, yeah. but the suffering that you've carried for years somehow disappears. And I think it's to do with the, the you know, this these movements, when you think about it, our first experience of trauma is being born. Mm -hmm. You know, coming out, into the, coming out of the womb into the bright light. And, and what's the first thing, once the doctors dealt with us, the nurses have dealt with us, the places in her mother's arms, mm -hmm. 
and the mother automatically does this. And even as a baby, when you're when you're upset, when you're when you're um, in the mother's arms, you're being soothed, yeah. and your, your face is being stroked. You know, so it's all that, all these things um, that that um, create that depth. So when you think about it, when you're shushing a baby, shh, you send it, into, you send it to sleep, or you send it into a calm state. So it makes sense for us to do this to us now as adults. Sounds amazing. I want to try it. <laughs> yeah, I'll do it. I'll do it with you. I'm, I, I'm still doing the course, um, and so I'm still doing case studies, which, um, I, I, yeah, let's do it. It's, yeah, it's, it's brilliant. It's a great, it's a great course. Um, yeah, so that's the only um, time that I've had a buzz. Um, Reiki doesn't... I liked, I liked it, but I didn't feel what other people have felt from it. Yeah. Um, uh, yeah. So, although I, <laughs> I did go to a girl once and she had a weighted blanket. I actually bought myself one. Have you tried one? A what blanket? Oh, weighted. Oh, uh, my dad got one actually. I was keen to steal it off him. I don't know if he's using it. I might get one. <laughs> my God, amazing, amazing. And again, I think that's reminders of being cocooned in our mother's arms. Uh -huh. that, that tightness, that closeness, I think that's what it resembles um, for me. And it can maybe help restless leg and things like that, can it? If you're yeah, I would think so, yeah. yeah. Mm. yeah. It, it feels like there's like so many toolkits, but like people maybe just need to find out about them and it's, it's trying like a pick and mix, like what works for you. Yes, I, I, I believe, I, I think mindfulness meditation can work for everybody, but then I wouldn't force it on everybody because I think you need to be ready and you need to you need to be at a place where it would work. But then I always this doing this havening course to me is I just want to be a mindful teacher and I have there's a part of me that wants to fix people because yeah. I want to fix myself. Um, so I have to constantly remind myself you're not fixing anybody. You're giving them mindfulness techniques. Mm -hmm. You're just empowering them. Um, but when sometimes people come and they've, they've, they've got deep-rooted trauma that they can't work through, I would send them away and I'd go, you need to go and speak to your doctor. Or you, you, there might be people that I know that I would recommend. Yeah. But um, this havening is a good way. But I've, I've worked with one person who had deep, deep issues. Um, and she dropped, but she was not willing to let go of her story. And I, I, I just thought, I don't know who could help her because she needs, to, I think there's a part of us that need to want to move from a pain. Mm -hmm. And if you're stuck in your pain and your pain is defining you, then it's hard. And I think you maybe just need to keep going through that pain till you have that moment of surrender and go, I'm fed up with this. I need a change. I want to, I want to feel different. But yeah, it was, it was, um, I, um, I think, there's so many great things out there and I've tried loads of them and I'll go, not for me. And then somebody will go, that was phenomenal. And, and I'll go, that's great, but not for me. But then I'll do something. And the first time I did Havening, I remember halfway through it and I felt, I, I, know, I was at the end and, I, and they asked me how, what, what number was that? And I said, I'm at a zero. I don't know why. I don't, I don't know why I'm at a zero, but I feel nothing. And it was a, an eight before. Oh. And then I was just like, I got up and I was like, I, it was like, I felt like crying because I had so much freedom from that painful thought. Um, so I was like, oh, boom, I'm doing this. It's like, see if I, see, see if I go out and I'm going to somebody's house and they, they go, I got this out of the Aldi's and I'm like, oh my God, I'm buying that. That's what I'm like. I'm like, I need that in my life. I need that in my life. <laughs> it's amazing. So like, what would be your advice for someone that's lost their mojo and the, the sort of, they're, they know that they're feeling really critical and they can't stop judging other people and they just probably judging themselves as well. What would be like a good starting point? Well, I, I always think for me, laughter is great, but sometimes to get there, you're maybe too far removed. I, I would always say to somebody, go and put a song on that reminds you of being 17 or a song that used to dance to in your room and you were taking the charts something like that, that so, a song that makes you feel young and liberated and free and, and uh, whatever song. So for me, it's 90s dance music, like 
uh, Culture B and um, Colin, Mr. Raider, Colin, Mr. Wrong. I put that on and uh, there's a, uh, I don't even remember the name, is it TTF? It's like a new emotion. Oh, I can yeah. feel it. And then I'll, I'll listen to those songs and I go, oh my God, all those songs are about love and, um, and freedom and, and ecstasy. But I, I don't know that we're talking about the other ecstasy, but it's like the one when I'm feeling it now, I'm like that ecstasy, that freedom, that delight in life. So I would say go and put a tune on and dance about to it or just listen to it and feel the vibrations of the music. Mm -hmm. And um, and I think that for me that lifts me, you know. I love I love music. I think that's why when I get in my car and there's a song on, I'm like message for me. <laughs> so um, I I would say tune into music. Um, that's definitely. But I also think um, if you've lost your mojo, speak to somebody that you trust. If there's nobody that you trust regarding that certain issue or um, whatever you've got going on write it down and um, send yourself an email and get it out your body because when it's in your body it's trapped and you get it out your body there's a wee bit of liberation from it so speak to someone you trust or if you don't trust anybody write it down or email email yourself it yeah get that negativity out of there it doesn't belong in there you've got a life to live and you know and there's so many amazing and music is like the greatest mojo injection, I think. It's funny because I used to have so much determination, so much, I was actually just striving too much. I wanted to be different. I wanted to be not me. And then all of a sudden I started appreciating who I was. And now I'm like, um, I, I, I don't know who I am because I'm so used to striving. But mindfulness says I shouldn't strive. I should just accept what is, and 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 I'm like I, I'm I'm at this point now. I'm going so I just and and often like the weird thing is through this lockdown I've just accepted it, and the phone has rang, emails have come in, and work has happened, because I believe I'm in a vibration of welcoming. Mm -hmm. But then I'm like, no, hold on, hold on. The wee voice comes in. No, you should be striving. You should be wanting more. You should want a better life. And I live in a flat in Glasgow, one bedroom flat. I bought it when I came out with a relationship as a stepping stone. But see now, I'm like, I'm going nowhere. This is cheap. It's, it's, I've got my car parking, I've got my veranda. I love it. I'm going nowhere. And um, uh, even if I meet a partner, I'll be like, you stay in your house, I'll stay here. Um, so um, I, I think I'm, there's a, losing your mojo, I, I thought I'd lost my mojo, but actually I think I just got to a place of contentment and acceptance and, I still have desires and I still want to work with creative people and I want to work with amazing people and I want to, like talking to you today, it just filled my boots, you know, it's just gave me some more fuel. So this is good, this, I'll, this is what I want in my life. Not, because um, I thought being on a television on a Saturday night meant success. Yeah. I mean, I experienced it, it was nice, but I was like, oh, right, oh, you're in the paper and, and the news of the world and the speaking about things from your mum's past. My mum lost a baby, and so did Amanda Holden that year. So they dug up information about my mum's um, baby, baby that she lost before me, and they were asking me about it, and I was like, what has that got to do? I just felt a, such an invasion of privacy. So I was like, you can keep your fame. I'll just, I'll just, uh, I'll just get contentment in other ways. Oh, so I. That's so inspirational for people to hear. It's, I know fame is a, you know, we're always, I love what you're saying about striving and it's just getting that balance, but contentment is key, isn't it? It's so key and it's just looking after yourself first, liking yourself, liking who you are and just living it, you know? Success to me used to be, uh, I used to think success was, Tonight, Matthew, I'm going to be Edward Reed. That's what I thought success was, right? <laughs> Something about taking you in stars in their eyes. Uh, or having your song played in Cat's Cafe in EastEnders. That's what I thought. I've been in a magazine, OK Magazine. That is that is success, right? And now I realise, uh, I mean, when you see those magazines, people are showing their house and their wealth and all this. And then two weeks later, they're in it talking about their, their drug overdose or their eating disorder. Do you know what I mean? It's just, it's just not... I'm not judging them, but you just think that is that is that is not real. What we are seeing, to me, success is going um, to bed at night happy and waking up happy. Uh, my favourite saying, I, I, I think, who was it that said it again? Orwell, I think it was that said, 
sleep in peace, wake in joy. And that's my mantra. Sleep in peace, that. wake in joy. Um, um, who was it? Uh, Epstein? Um, um, uh, somebody, I thought it was Louise Hay that said it, but I think it was somebody before her. So yeah, that's what I say to all my students uh, when I leave them. I'm like, that, that's your mantra. Um, sleep in peace, wake in joy. And that is to me is success. Oh, I love that. I'm going to use that. <laughs> oh, well, you've been absolutely amazing. And I'll put all your details in the show notes, but do you have like a favorite place for people to contact you? Probably just my website. Um, uh, um, my email is hiya at mredwardreed.com. I wanted cooey, cooey at Mr. Edward Reed, but they wouldn't allow me to have it. Oh, shocking. <laughs> and, and will you sing us out? Will you sing us a few lines of something that helps with your emotion? I mean, we've, we've got to hear some beautiful songs through you throughout this, but um, maybe a couple of lines or something. <laughs> I think, um, hold on, let me just Google the lights in case I can't remember them, right? <laughs> I, think I, know, I think I know them anyway. Reach for the sky and hold your head up high Cause tonight and every night you're a superstar oh, I think that's what people should know That is amazing, what a voice you've got, like seriously Work right. it, own it Yes! Oh yeah baby! You're amazing, <laughs> honestly Thank you, Thank you. So much for coming on the Mojo Injection and firing us all up. Woo